Good morning everyone, Hendra here from Cape Cornwalls. Today I find myself in the beautiful Bainscliffe Pass, showing you some Drosera rubifolia. So I'm going to take you in a little bit closer and have a look at this one of the most rare but amazing sundews you find in the Western Cape. So here we have a bit of a closer look than the shade, so I can really get them in that last shot. Drosera rubifolia, named so it has red leaves, rubri is red, folia is leaf. So rubri folia means the red leaf sundew. It is very red and very densely clumped here, on this sort of underhang. There's a lot of them over here, with water dripping down constantly. So this is a perennial species, it doesn't go dormant. But it only grows where it's permanently wet, and it's only known from about three locations. There are a ton of them under here, and all of these actually burnt earlier this year. If I pan you out here, you can see there's a lot of burnt vegetation here, lots of grass, and lots of bulbs that come out after the fires. Fires. So basically the last burnt, goodness knows how long ago, and in February this year, I'm filming now in December, 2024. A fire ripped through and burned about 250 square kilometers of mountains, including where these drops of refolia grow. But luckily, these sundews have very long, well established roots, and they grow back quite well. You see this in cultivation as well. Many sundews, especially South African ones, if the top part of the plant dies, they grow back just fine, which might be a fire adaptation or just usefulness on the, term, on the plant's part. So this is also you took the Larry Biscal Martyr, the Cape Bladderwort that grows along with it. You can see the kind of grassy leaves up here, it's very difficult to form this angle. The little leaves are the Tricularia leaves, technically they're not true leaves, only the traps are leaves. That's a story for another day. So Rubrophodia is an incredibly cryptic species, only known from three locations with some other historical records. It's described from near Sirius by Paul Devitt. And this spot was found fairly recently by a young lad here from Cape Town, Ben. Shout out to Ben, he's a legend. Quite far from any of the other spots. And you can see how uh, they're growing under kind of all this grass that's popped up now since the fire. Getting harassed by flies here, yeah, they're growing with this irid, I believe Cadona Riser. That's not that, I'll put the name in the video. And also Aristea, the Cape Blues, these lovely blue flowers that are growing here. And past here it gets quite dry and you don't find any more rubrifolia. There are a few more spots around which I'll show you. I'm up here to orchid hunt, so hopefully we find some of those too. Anyway, see you in the next spot. So here I find myself near the first rubrifolia spot. And look how many there are. The dresser rubrifolia really has a penchant for kind of these wet, seepy areas. You can see all nice ones. And what's interesting at this spot is some anthocyanin free varieties of the plant. So there's a few of these, I see them here every time. A bright green, which is quite ironic for a plant with a red leaf sundew. Get lots of you trickle area of biscuit water, there's a nice patch of them up there. Flying profusely now late in the summer. This constant stream of water is very cold, very nice, and very drinkable on such a hot day. And just over to the side here are some more sitting a bit more exposed. We're going to open slightly drier, but not dry. Here's a nice plant, you can already get an idea of the size. Interesting, the stems aren't incredibly red. I'm a little early for the flowers. Looks like this one actually opened yesterday. But man, where they do grow, they grow in profusion. There's a lot up there. Come down here, and it's crazy because this was all burnt to a crisp earlier this year. In Time Mountain, you can see it's pretty low still. All this dead veg woody vegetation here. This after from the fire, now everything is re-sprouting. Including the drossel, which have come back swimmingly. Just a stone's throw over, there's a few more of the rubrifolia growing still in this kind of peaty slop. In the middle there is a lovely orchid, Dysa atricopilla. Also seen this on the peninsula recently. This is a wasp pollinated species. Very weird shape. More utricularia, more other stuff. There's some other orchids here that are in seed, but not in flower unfortunately. Interestingly, something I've not seen up here before. This is Drosera elysiae. Nice hairy little guy, not nearly as red as the Drosera rubrifolia, obviously. 
growing slightly drier below the seep. We're a refer to it all growing sort of in there. We get a better far out view. So much of this grass now after the fire. Very, very interesting. Rurifolia is always, always red, even in the shade, pretty much. Whereas the Celestia has a red tint to it, but not quite. I think it's a drier adapted species, hence all the hairiness and ability to tolerate some fairly dry soil here. So here's a better look at that Dysa atrica pillar. Very strange shape. They sort of flower in these big radial clusters. This only has a few flowers, but some of them have nine or ten plus. So this releases pheromones of a female wasp. The male wasp comes and tries to copulate with it and ends up with pollinia attached. And he goes off to pollinate another plant. Here's another fairly nice specimen. They have the most insane colours for it. An orchid here, usually they're pretty uniform in colour, but this throws out the white, black and pink. Just lovely. So a bit further along up here, I found the sister species of Dysatrica pillar. This is Dysa bivalvata, also wasp pollinated by a different species. And it's quite different coloration. It's white with a kind of black lip. And here we have some Dysatrica pillar again. And it has a black, white and pink. These do hybridize. I saw some, which will be in another video. They're pretty, pretty fascinating, these two. Just over here, and just to give you a look at the habitat, very open now after the burn. It's kind of peaty and sandy. Very open, but now starting to get drier. Here is a nice atricopola specimen. Very floriferous. I count about six flowers. Super, super nice. Just wish I could have seen one of the wasps, that would have been cool. I find myself again with a very nice view. At my feet here are some dormant Drosera linaflora. The unicorn is out now, so this is and this is the flora complex. And now they've gone completely dormant for summer in December. It's still damp here actually, but the stems have completely dried up, they've separated from the root. So the root is sitting now nice having dormancy. All you find is this dry black stems are quite woody. It's a bit of a force to crunch them. Still some seed heads on here, so I'll continue to disperse seed into the summertime. Sometimes you even find them into the next winter, but eventually they'll decay into this kind of open peatland. So another orchid here. I've seen a few drier ones, but this is the first semi-alive one I've found. It's the Ceratundra atrata, common shield orchid. It's a nice, fairly common species after fires and burn areas even for a few years afterwards, so it's not a strict fire species. It can also be an old fain moss. It's growing here in this very marshy habitat, and a lot of them were in dry sands as well. Hopefully it is a nice one in life, where you can see the very interesting shape. I think the shield orchid part comes from kind of how round and long these are, kind of like a medieval shield. Here yeah, are some Drosterid on the floor that are still clinging onto life. They're quite red, they're quite stressed. They're already starting to go dormant. So you start getting this kind of crisping up of the leaves on top. And they go brown top down until they're completely dormant. So these are persisting pretty well into December. Usually by November they're dormant, but it's quite cool to see maybe this moisture and high elevation gives them some reprieve from the very hot, dry African sun. Now here, another beautiful sight. These are a field of Watsonias. Not sure of the species, I'll add it in. Flowering here after fire, Watsonias are very prolific post-fire bloomers. They love this open habitat. And this PT mountain area keeps bearing gifts. So here we have now a proper Dysa atrica pillar. Massive flower head, massive plant. Some Dysa bivalvate here as well, the white one. And of course, what you guys came for, Drosera rubrifolia. These ones are now nice in the sun. They glisten so, so well. There's quite a lot of them over here in this kind of very, very wet heat. You can see the ground is kind of wet over here. If we get a closer look at some, you can see they're coming into flower. Everything about them is red. The top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf. They're fairly hairy as well, like Drosera lacea. You just don't really see it. Between the redness, super, super cool. This plant here might be the hybrid between Dysa bivalvata and Dysa atricopilla. It's a bit hard to tell, but the kind of simple color scheme 
we had lips, etc. I could give it away. I mean, if you look at this very elegant plant and this kind of half coloured device over here, I have a suspicion it might be the hybrid. I mean, there's so many of them in here. I'm trying to all these beautiful Watsonias and other vegetation. I'm very, very lucky to be able to see all this. I live in such an amazing country. So now I've managed to find a Ceratundra atrata in flower. Very kind of pale green, not incredibly impressive flowers. A very interesting shape nonetheless. There's a kind of dry stem next to it. Yeah, this is the whole, whole plant, so it's quite big. A lot of flowers, it's actually the biggest one I've seen, I think. I'm not sure what it's pollinated by, actually. This is a late flowering species, so maybe bees or flies. It seems to me that orchids like a pretty view, because right here, is Dyser Cornuta, the Golden Dyser, which is a name more appropriate for ones in the eastern part of the country. I have a yellow, very yellow mouth. These are fairly whitish with a black spot and a purple hood. These are really interesting orchids. They smell really good and they're quite common in the Cape at this time of year. Fairly dry growing, you can see here. Not a lick of moisture to be found as you're working my way uphill, hopefully to find something more interesting. So it's nice to see familiar face every so often. This fine plant here is a bit of a scourge. This is a Huckia, a silky Huckia. It's an Australian Protea. It's quite invasive here in the Cape, you can see there's another one. Just over here, they seem to have managed to survive the fire, sheltered up here among the rocks. So these are another Sorotinus species. That means they keep their seeds and cones down here until fires, after which they break out and germinate. Just like our indigenous proteas. It's quite ironic that we got another protea from Australia. Luckily we have good biological control from these that's really put a dent in the seed production. They don't grow super well, they're not as much of a pest as they used to be. Still very annoying. Very thorny as well, the leaves are very very spiky. So I'm gonna try to kick this plant over before I go on my way. Anyway, if you ever see one of these of the cape, cut it down, just make sure it's not a Mountain cedar, the withering tonia not a flora that has very similar pods, very different leaves. So finally I find an orchid that I have not yet seen before. This is Dysotelopagonus. Tiny little yellow fly you can see there next to my fingers. I have the growing these little kind of cracks in the rock here in the sandstone. Let's be the weathered out. There's a few plants kind of hiding in the darkness and they're growing in these little edges. It's a very cool little species. I've not seen this before. It's pretty occasional on these kind of rocky ledges. Slightly damp here. It's shaded out from the sun. So super cool find. I'm very stoked about that. So here we have another Dyser. This is Dyser racemosa. This is a fire stimulated but evergreen species. It's growing in here with all the Dorosary Rifoli you could ever ever hope for. This place has thousands so this is a nice open area after the burn. The view is just incredible. You can really get a good look around. But just here, very peaty and very wet. And the plants are thriving. So I'm super happy. That brings me up to seven or eight orchids now. Lots of refolia, a few new spots. They are locally abundant in this area, but generally so rare. So very cool to see. So finally, an interesting fire stimulated orchid that I haven't seen in a while. This is Evotella rubiginosum. A very interesting first season fire bloom. It smells really good. This one is a little past its prime. It's starting to fade out a little bit. But very, very cool. Very sweet scent. Floral fragrance. This is on a fairly steep slope. Just saw it by chance while photographing a crab spider. It's a very, very cool find. I'm glad to have finally found one for today. It's been fairly deprived of cool fire stimulated species that you don't see very often. So this, I cannot remember the name, it might be Hovea. It's a parasitic plant. Super white, super frilly, very interesting, but you'll see it doesn't really have proper leaves. It's just got these little squibs. So I'm not sure what this parasitizes off of. That's a very interesting thing to see up here, kind of in the middle of nowhere. We have quite a few parasitic plants in South Africa. So I'm glad we got to see at least one of them today. And here we have yet another Dyser, the yellow Dyser, Dyser tenuifolia. Very pointy, very cute. 
loves these kind of drier bits as well as bogginess. This is usually fairly wet. A lot of Drosera trinovia kind of hanging on for dear life here, there's little red guys. There's a few tenifolia over here. It's a very cute species, but very small, very yellow. Now resting at a waterfall is never really a bad idea, especially when you have some Drosera capensis next to it. This is definitely the most famous Cindy from the Cape, one of the most commonly grown in the world. Such an incredible species, but in the Cape it's relatively uncommon, only growing in permanently wet spots. Again, here it's worth the trickle area a bit for Martha, a big form, with some handsome shade. Growing in and near some of this amazing green sphagnum moss. Now, this water coming down is very cold, it's very soft, the mineral count. Ultimate bench stuff is only 14 parts per million for CDS, total dissolved solids. Very soft, very minerals, with rich in tannins. Really clear, crystal clear, there's a little crab sitting down there. I'll see if I can find a few more capensis for you. But these are excellent. So here, the last bit of capensis that we have for today, growing by this amazing stream again. These are nice and big and broad leaf plants, similar to the ones you get in cultivation. Not every Drosera capensis I find in bands to it is wide leaf. Even though the most common cultivated bands to form is the wide leaf form, you also get a stemmy one. And others are just kind of small and wimpy, I found. This is just an amazing patch here growing in the moss, literally on top of the rock. Pretty much, they root into this moss, they grow super nicely, it's nice and cool for them. I'm super stoked to have seen them, unfortunately no open flowers today. But that's how it goes sometimes. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.